Good morning. Oh, hey, Caleb. Hello, CD. Okay. All right, showing me we have eight on right now. So, I'm assuming first day back from spring break. Oh, we just lost one. <laughs> um, we may be a little slow going. And in everybody's defense, you know. Me actually getting it up and running by 11 is a pretty cool thing. Good morning, Xander. Good morning, Kaylee. Um, so, uh, Chad says he's going to take Rosie. I can hear. Oh, wait. i got to turn me off. Um, no volume. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so, Chad's going to take Rosie out. Do I need to pull that? It's tough. Um, so Chad's going to take Rosie out. Keep saying that over and over again. There she goes. Um, so we're going to talk about... <laughs> Good morning, Chad. Good morning. Um, oh. <laughs> Rosie is running from Chad. Oh, good morning, Libby. Oh. Cohen, how are you? Good morning, good morning, good morning. There's Chloe and Ella. Um, oh, Kayla, Logan, good morning. Um, my break was about, I'm sure, like everybody else's. It was just full of pretty much the same old, same old. Right? I got non-renewable energy done, so I'm going to guess I'm the only one, maybe Luke, that was uh, working on AP Environmental over the whole break, but um, I worked on that. I uh, worked out with my family. I don't know, guys. I, like, I hate that this is a pandemic. I know, Matthew. Thank you. I miss you, too. I, like... Good morning. It is, Harriet. It is a beautiful day. Um, so, other than just working on, not talking to y'all, working on AP Environmental. That's about the only thing I've done that's different. And even though I'm not, like, talking, talking to you guys, it, it really does make a difference to get to talk to you guys. Um, so, let me tell you about what's happening to us. So, April the 3rd, they made the announcements that your test is going to be... I'm going to say May 3rd, and I'm not sure. Um, but it's going to be two questions, two FRQs. One's going to be 25 minutes. One's going to be 15 minutes. And I think it's 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 going to be like 60-40, right? The 25-minute question is going to be worth 60%. The 15-minute question is going to be worth 40%. And... Um, or 65, 35, somewhere around in those percentages. May 18th. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, so we've bought some time. And the other thing that everybody's slipping out about is that it's going to be open book, open note. And let me just say, duh, right? Like, uh, obviously, it's going to be open book and open note. And if it were me, I would have all kinds of crazy things. Like, my whole room would be... Uh, full of colors with like, I don't know, floating helium balloons that have different contents on them so I could run over there and, you know, try to utilize that information. But the reality of the situation is they are planning on creating questions to where you can't just open up your book to page 437 and just start typing what the book says. So what I'm trying to express to you is it's going to be one of those where you, if you can't flesh it out, you can't get the point. So that's why I've picked up non-renewable. And then after non-renewable, we're going to do renewable. And I don't know, guys, I could be completely wrong, but I just feel like renewable, non-renewable, some form of energy is going to be one of your two questions because it's so, 
like it, it looks very simple on the surface, but then as you're going to see, it gets very in depth very quickly. And unless you have been enrolled in a class like we are, you're not going to know. So, um, I'm going to start working on chapter, I think it's 16 next, which is non-renewable. And that's going to be the name of the game. You're going to flesh it out, flesh it out, flesh it out. Um, you're going to connect. That's going to be the secret. Connected the biogeochemical cycles, connecting the um, natural capitals. Um, Luke says, do you have any idea what type of question will be like? Like the structure. I think there are different variations in FRQ and they're only cho choosing certain ones. I don't know yet, Luke. Um, I don't think that we'll have a math question, but I don't know yet. Um, I haven't met with my advanced Kentucky people to know for sure. Now, there are um, there's a YouTube page for AP Environmental, and you guys are absolutely welcome. Right now, there's just like this floodgate of all of this information. And the reality of the situation is... There's no way to narrow this down. Like, it's just, it, there's just not. Like, it, they're not going to say it's going to be over this. Like, you're getting two FRQ questions. They're going to be like A, B, C, D, and you're going to have 25 minutes and then 15 minutes and then you're done. It's going to be a 45-minute bobsled through hell for you. So, that's, that's what it's going to be. As far as the content goes, like I said, I'm guessing it's going to be, I'm, Banking on one of them being some form of energy. And then I was thinking maybe the other one might be the different um, biomes and like the interactions within the biomes. So I may go back and pick up and let's just look at those different biomes and be sure that you understand when we're talking about a tundra, what we're talking about. We're talking about... Um, a boreal forest. You know what you're talking about. Like those are the kinds. I'm just trying to think of what are big that they can. That's going to give you wiggle room to get small. Because I think that's going to be the secret. No one has ever done this before. So there's just no. <laughs> Do you know what? 11-11 11, 11 every day. I have thought about that now. You guys have ruined me. Uh, Caleb says 11-11 11, 11, make a wish. I swear. <laughs> this never even crept into my head until you guys got here. So um, that's what that's what I'm thinking. Remember, we said that one of them was going to be setting up a, an experiment. Was the new thing that AP Environmental was going to do is that you were going to have to have an experiment. And um, I, I just I don't know that that's going to stick. I'm going to talk to my mentor again. We've got over a month, so we're going to just keep keep on keeping on. And we're just gonna we're just gonna keep fine tuning this weapon, and um, okay. See you, Max. Uh, Max has to go do some geometry. Sucks to be him, right? I mean, geometry's great. <laughs> yes, yes. Like that's what we, I think. The more you can get into it, the better you're gonna be. So here's what your five day forecast is looking like for me. Um, we're going to go over 15.1, 15.2 today lecture. Um, I've already posted your, <laughs> I've already posted your vocab list, your review questions, your PowerPoint. I just wrote your test this morning. See you. Good luck in geometry. Yes. No. Kaylee says, they said that colleges will take any score, so do you automatically pass? I'm going to say the answer is no to that. You still have to have a three. Um, I think what they're talking about there, Kaylee, is you, um, they were worried that the colleges weren't going to take your scores because you're doing them in 45 minutes. Logan wants to know what teachers do in geometry right now. I don't know. Smith. Miss Smith. What? She needs to pick a new time. She's an early morning person. What's she doing on at 11? Um, so, so, three. Three is what we're shooting for. They were just worried that the schools weren't going to accept your um, 
any passing grade because you're just doing a 45-minute test. Yes, that is my understanding is you have to have a three. And that's what we're all going to get. Okay? At least. At least. We're all going to at least get a three. Yeah. Cohen says not Fortney. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to assume that we're um, ready. I have been... Um, I've been a little inundated with this non-renewable energy. Listen, this is one of these things where, thanks, Xander. Um, this is kind of one of these contents where I thought I knew a lot. Um, and until last week, I evidently did not know anything. So I've learned a ton this week about um, oil and coal and gas and nuclear. And I want to say, right as soon as we get started... We are from Kentucky. My daddy, amongst many other things, was a coal miner. And um, and so I, I have really struggled with how aggressive this textbook has gotten with coal. So um, it's just kind of like the food processing and the farmers. I am not the the standard teacher for this class for a lot of reasons but this is one of them so i'm going to present the information as well as i can but have also dug in deep as i always do and have found the other side of the argument to try to give you a more fair and balanced viewpoint of this so if you are are a family from a coal miner if you are um product of a coal miner like I am. If you live next to a coal mine, I don't want you to leave lecture over this next week and be like, oh, I'm bound for Hades because you are not. So we start out with the word, what is net energy and why is it important? So net is our word. Net, net, net. This is all about the net. So Energy resources vary greatly in their net energy yields. The amount of energy available from a resource minus, if you are a underliner, you are minus underlining the amount of energy needed to make it available. So, um, I found this and, you know, I just think I'm funny and cool and stuff. So, net energy is all that matters. So, let's look at this from a um, big, like a, like a, like a, like a big scope, okay? So remember, we've got our inputs, our throughputs, and our outputs, right? So your inputs, this is all of the energy that is necessary to make something happen. The throughputs, this is like all, this is like the actual reaction happening. And then the output is what I have, what I have not created, because remember, it's energy. We don't create it or destroy it, right? Law of conservation of energy. We do not create or destroy energy. We are not God. We simply transform it. So your net energy is all of this startup energy minus what comes out. So if it takes you, let's use chicken nuggets like we did it when we actually got to see each other. If it took you 20 chicken nuggets to get started and you only made 22 chicken nuggets, it's not a great yield. Your net is only two, right? Like that's that's not great. So we're going to talk about high yield, high net yield, medium net yield, low net yield, and believe it or not, we have negative net yield. So, um, and the negative is a little more aloof. We'll get into some of how they have categorized that. So, the other example that we've used, and I think we've used that in this class, is your uh, gross earnings versus your net, right? And your net is... Um, what what monies you have after taxes have been taken out. So your gross is your like, I just got this, you know, $50,000 a year job. Well, you're not actually getting $50,000 a year. You're getting like, <laughs> I don't know, 30, right, to spend. And like 20 of it is going back to taxes. So net, net is important. So this is the idea that we cannot, right, law of conservation of energy. We cannot just create energy. Energy has to come from somewhere. It's, it's all around us. It's everywhere. 
So it takes energy to make energy, and that energy is not the net energy, right? That's the, that's the startup energy. So if you look at oil, which is where we start, our chapter starts with oil. We have to find the oil. We have to pump the oil from beneath the floor. We have to transfer it to a refinery. And listen, oil refineries, I had no idea. I didn't even know what they were until this week. So we got, we got some learning to do, children. And then we convert it into whatever. In this, in, your book says, in this instant, we're going to convert it to gasoline. So to get the net, your book is saying, we've got to take all of this into consideration. Um, I also want you to think about this like we think about full cost pricing. Remember when we talked about full cost pricing? What's the total cost of getting the oil from where it is to where we need it to be? The second law of thermodynamics is huge in, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to predict that it's also huge in our next chapter. Um, so, some of the high quality energy that is used in each step is automatically degraded into low quality. So second law of thermodynamics is basically telling you that you cannot start with a low quality and end with a high quality. It's entropy. It's always going to degrade. We're always going to have some sort of chaos in between point A and point B. Um, in anatomy, we would talk about you're always going to lose energy to heat. Always, always, always. And, and this is, you know, heat is probably a great place for a lot of this stuff to be lost as well. So, oh yeah, mostly lost is heat that ends up in the environment. <laughs> Look at me. So, the energy that is left is the net yield energy. So, the net is, after it's all over and done with, the total amount of high quality energy available from an energy resource, there's that word again, minus the high quality energy needed to make it. So, I want you to, if you are note-taking, I want you to write E-R-O-I. That's very important because this is your energy return on your investment. So, um, I feel like there are some of you guys that are interested in the stock market. You're interested in um, investments. And this is it. That's exactly what this is. We're saying how much energy do I have to put into a system to get energy out? How much am I investing? How much am I putting in? Um, some of you guys can think about, uh, let's see, what was his name? Oh, he just died. Kobe Bryant. Um, he shot a thousand, I think he shot a thousand free throws or a thousand shots a day. A thousand. Like, I know that you guys, like, everybody exaggerates all numbers to make your stories better, but, I mean, I... I dare you to shoot 10 and feel the fatigue, right? But the point was, is he's putting all of that energy in because what he wanted was to be the greatest. So you, you have to surpass everyone else in order to make that happen. So this is out of your book. Um, and I'd love to tell you the page, but I can't. Oh, look at there. Look at me. Page 375. My gosh, I'm so cool. So, um, you're looking at different sources. And I'm just drawing your attention to the fact they're high, medium, low, and negative. With all of these different energy sites. So, um, transportation, heat, electricity, space heating, um, and, and I'm going to, I don't know, but I'm just going to say that's just not the space heaters, like the little electric space heaters. This is a whole big, like, heating your house. Okay. So some energy resources help to, uh, need help to compete in the marketplace. And uh, the rule is an energy resource with a low or negative energy yield can have a hard time competing in the marketplace with other alternatives that have a medium or a high net yield unless it receives some sort of subsidy, some sort of uh, help from the government. So if we look at the things back here on this list that are low, if you look under electricity, one of the first ones that jumps out at me is um, solar cells and geothermal. So solar cells, everybody's pushing it, right? Um, and yet it's, it's low, low to medium. So... Uh, if you guys, I don't know, I feel like we've talked about this. If you wanted to put solar cells on your house, you get credits from the government, 
right? For your, uh, to set it up, you get credits on your taxes, you get um, a rebate on your electricity bills. So these are all forms in which the government is coming behind you and saying, here, use this. This is an option. It's making it more uh, desirable for, for the common person to pick up. All right, so nuclear power plants is something we're not gonna, we're gonna spend a ton of time in, I think, 15-4. Um, so nuclear power has a low net energy yield. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, I believe that we need to look at nuclear power. Um, and they're going to tell you some terrible things about nuclear power. But I believe that we can do some things, and there are probably already some alternatives out there playing with nuclear power that, I mean, it is a huge bang for your buck. But they're, they're considering it low and we're going to look at why, but they're taking it all the way from digging the uranium-235 out of the earth all the way to the 240,000 years it takes for it to stop being radioactive. So because you're going from point A to 240,000, 240,000 years, that's why it's low. Um, but it's about this big. It's a little pellet about this big, and it's the equivalent of a ton of coal. So in the this in the this right now, it's huge. So I, I I'm we're gonna get into that. The nuclear power fuel cycle again. I'm not real sure why it's. I guess it's just introducing this to you to kind of keep it in the forebrain because we're gonna cover it much more insanely. Uh, moving forward, but like I said, we're gonna um, we're gonna harvest the uranium. We're gonna make nuclear fuel. Uh, the building of the power plant. They even go so far as to talk about the amount of carbon dioxide that is emitted to build a power plant, the the concrete and such. Um, each plant they have its life as forty to sixty years, and I don't know about that. Um, that's going to be something that we're just going to have to sort of either accept or Harry and friends is going to be uh, looking some stuff up for us because we have over 200 that they're saying are going to age into this 40 to 60 year old age gap in the next decade. So if they really are only useful for 40 to 60 years and then we have to decommission them, then that's, that's a big problem. Uh, Kaylee asks, high net energy is better. Yes, yes. So that's all of 15.1. That's why we're just jumping into kind of what is net energy and what are we looking for. So what we're looking for is what's it take to get it going? How much do we get? How much bang for our buck do we, how much bang for our buck do we get? So this is oil. Here we go. Now, oil, um, there was this show called The Beverly Hillbillies. Well, listen to a story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer brother kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting for food and up through the ground came a bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. Well, the next thing you know, oh, Jed's a millionaire. His kin folks said, Jed, boo! Away from here. They said California is a place you ought to be, so they loaded up a truck and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is. Swimming pools, movie stars. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I love y'all. <laughs> I can hear myself in my ears and it is, it is painful. Um, so, Black gold, Texas tea, you know, like millionaire, all of those things are. <laughs> Thanks, Kaylee. Thanks, Andrew. So, um, understand that it's big money. Um, and that's, that's going to be the things that we look at. So, this is a pie chart, but I want you to ingest kind of... <laughs> 
kind of ingest what the whole thing is. So the inside of the pie is showing you natural gas, coal, oil, renewable, nuclear. Oh, sorry, my notes are And then if you look on the gray on the outside of your circle, that's all non-renewable. So they're trying to tell you two different things. <laughs> Thanks, Caleb. They're trying to show you two different things. They're trying to show you all of this is non-renewable and this little bitty bit is renewable. So let's pause right there and say, we know the difference between renewable and non-renewable, right? Renewable is anything that we can replace, yes, in, in the same amount of time it took us to consume it, right? So we can, <laughs> no. so we can, um, so, so we can keep up with the pace. So like the paper farms, the tree, the tree farms, paper companies, all that, that is renewable. <laughs> And then uh, non-renewable, we cannot replace them at the rate that we're using them. So everything we're studying is renewable uh, based on how long it takes us to consume them. So what do we use oil for? The short answer is yes, that's what we use oil for. Um, I had no idea. We're going to talk about petrochemicals here in a minute. I didn't even know that was a word until last week. And I eat it. And I enjoy it. So prepare yourself. Um, so we heat our homes. We grow most of our food. We transport peoples and goods. We make energy resources available for use. We manufacture most of the things we use every day. Plastics, cosmetics, asphalt. Um, so I found these... <laughs> I found these cartoons, and I, I, like, right out of the gate, right? We're talking about how bad oil sucks, um, and I thought, we need to look at what oil does for us. So, this one says, don't worry, dear, we can live without heating oil. I'm going to go walk the dog, and the dog is in a little brick of water. This is pretty funny. Um, in light of the circumstances, this is the best we can do. Put a bag on our head because products like lipstick, makeup, nail polish, lotion are all derived from fossil fuels in one way or another. This one, um, you know, you got to love some good bull every now and then. So shutting them down, put 9.2 million folks out of work. But on the bright side, that's 9.2 million folks who can't afford a steak dinner. So um, understand that with the 9.2 million, I also want to make the counter argument that alternative energy resources are also going to create jobs, right? So um, to me, this is not exactly, this is erring on the other side of, too far on the other side of the argument. I love this one. Um, by my calculations, if you flap your arms 200 times per second, you'll be there in 137 hours, right? <laughs> Toledo to Washington, D.C. So that's Ohio to Washington, D.C., right? Like, that can't be good. Um, and for all of you guys that don't, I mean, I, I feel like this kind of falls into the whole uh, pandemic that we're in right now. Because at first, everybody was like, well, yeah, I mean, I'll just stay home until... I want to not be home, and then I'll go and I'll do what I want to do, but everybody else needs to stay home, and it was like slowly peeling this onion back with, no, no, it's going to take sacrifices for everyone, from everyone, for every area of your life, so if you're thinking, well, I don't use makeup, oh, well, I don't, you know, plastics are the devil, uh, you can't even play golf, right, like, it's crazy. Golf balls, fishing rods, all kinds of sporting gear are made from oil-based materials. Um, no space travel. Right? <laughs> and I, I shouldn't laugh at that, but I just do. I think it's funny. Um, Kaylee was saying what exactly is geothermal? Uh, and we're not going to talk about that right now, Kaylee. We are gonna, that's going to come in the next one, right? Uh, the... Short is geo, you know, rock, thermal, heat. So we're using, a lot of times, uh, geothermal heating will use, um, I just said we aren't going to talk about it. Here I am talking about it. Uh, one example, real quick example is, you know, you can run pipes so far under the ground and it stays a specific temperature to heat and cool your house. So, uh, but we'll get to geothermal in the next chapter, I'm sure. All right. Crude oil or petroleum. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, 
um, that I forgot that petroleum and crude oil was the same thing and I was making your test and I did not use crude oil I used petroleum and then I got so mad at myself because I was looking for the answer to the question and I couldn't find crude oil so I raised the question only to realize hey stupid it's petroleum it's right there so please remember crude oil and petroleum and I as I am writing the question I was like okay use petroleum because they need to know both and then like I'm sure something happened and I end up forgetting like the argument I just had in my own brain so good luck with that one it is black it is gooey and I do use the word gooey a lot you know like gooey crude I don't know but in my head it worked um it does look like this, right? It's a mixture of combustible hydrocarbons. So remember, a hydrocarbon is a carbon. So we have our C, and then the electrons on the outermost energy level. Do you guys remember what they're called? Valence, yes. Do you remember what the magic number is? Eight, yes. So carbon is in, it has... Um, it's in the sixth column. So it has the two in the S orbital, so that's full. And then it goes to the next orbital and it puts four in there, one, two, three, four. So it has four valence electrons and then a hydrocarbon is gonna plunk a hydrogen on all four sides. So um, we drew, let me just see if I can slam some stuff around. We drew the carbon on the board, if you remember, and then we put the hydrogens on there. I remember, of all people, Trevor Church really picked up on that. So, for some of you guys, we drew the dots, and that made you feel better. And then we counted the dots. And the only two that were special are hydrogen and helium. Those are the only two that have the magic number of two. Everybody else has a magic number of eight. So this is a hydrocarbon, right? We also, uh, methane, right? We also drew this. Right, we have it here. You have the double bond. And we went through that whole video. I hope you guys could see that. I do have a whiteboard here, Kaylee. Um, oh, I'm sorry, okay, sorry. I don't know if that's any better. Okay, CH4. Um, so crude oil was formed from the decayed remains of ancient organisms that were crushed beneath the layers of rocks for millions of years. So we have always, always, always done, um, they're the dinosaur bones, not necessarily, I mean, yes, but uh, most of the time, the, the book is really talking a lot about tiny sea plants and tiny sea animals. So you want to kind of cue in on sea plants, sea animals. Now, how do they find this petroleum, huh? crude oil? So they use um, large machines to pound the earth, and then they send, the, as the machines are pounding the earth, they're sending shock waves through, and then they're measuring the, the echo, if you will, the return, and that creates a 3D seismic map. Okay, that's one of your test questions. We use this machine and it beats down on the earth and then it returns the waves and it creates a 3D seismic map. So, um, if the oil companies think they found a good deposit, they go ahead and they drill there. Now, I don't know why this is called peak production and maybe some of you will. I don't know. Oh, let's see what we've got here. 
Um, so for the nuclear power, it seems that the oldest nuclear power plant was active in 1969. Uh, in addition, the NCR granted 74 out of 100 operating reactors a 20-year license renewable. Okay, well that, but that puts them to 60. So in 2029, the oldest reactor must repeal its license. It's not be repealed already. Good. Thank you, Harry. Nice. Who is tartar sauce? Oil is made up of dead dinos. Plastic is made up of oil. So wouldn't plastic sauce be better if that was? <laughs> ah, I like that. I like that. Okay. So... Um, after years of pumping, usually a decade or so, the pressure drops and the production drops, and that's when we call it peak production. I don't understand. I don't know why. Um, I guess I could go uh, deeper if I wanted to, but I've just decided to commit this to memory, that for whatever reason, peak performance is less pressure and less production which is not our peak production. Um, global peak production would occur when the rate of global production of conventional oil begins to decline faster than new oil fields are found. Let's see. Kaylee says, it's called peak production because that's when the well has hit its peak of pumping oil well. Well, that's what I thought too, Kaylee, but that's not what the book says. Look, it's saying the pressure has dropped and the production starts to decline. It's going to go downhill? Okay. So, um, this is just showing you. So, this is the year of the peak oil production. So, we're saying, notice that some of it is already in red and some of it is in yellow, which means if you're in red, you're past your peak. If you're at yellow, you haven't hit your peak yet. And so, the more that we have in red, the less oil we're going to have available to us. Now, here we go. Crude oil cannot be used as it is. So this um, column that you're looking at right there with me, this is this is refining oil. I had no idea this is what it was. I mean, it's so cool to me. I don't know if you guys have ever done, I'm assuming in middle school, you did a density column where the different fluids lined up according to how dense they were. Um, with like some sort of alcohol on the top, all the way with like your oil, right? Your your cooking oil or whatever you used on the bottom and then everything in between. Um, so this is called a refinery and that's actually what they're doing. They're heating it up and then the oil is being transported then into this column and then we're pulling off the substance based on its density as it is heated. So it's cool. I've got a couple of videos um, that it's going to help us look at oil refineries. I got to remember to unplug my. Wand. From the outside, a refinery might look like an endless maze of pipes, chimney stacks, steel columns, and vessels. The fact is that oil refineries are highly sophisticated industrial facilities, transforming crude oil into valuable products used in a myriad of applications. The process starts when crude oil, extracted from the ground and transported by ship or pipeline, arrives at the refinery. is first heated at various temperatures in an atmospheric distillation unit to separate it into different fractions. In simpler refineries, the resulting components are further processed to remove impurities such as sulfur and modify their physical or chemical properties to make them suitable for incorporation into final products. Then the blending comes in, mixing in different components and additives to prepare the finished products that are familiar to us all, such as LPG, gasoline, diesel and jet fuel. The finished products are stored in large tank farms ready to be transported to the end users via a combination of pipelines, rail, road and waterways. However, modern refineries can do much more. 
Most European refineries use complex processes in order to extract more high-value products from a barrel of crude oil. This generally involves vacuum distillation of the atmospheric residue, followed by cracking of the distillate, and possibly further upgrading of the vacuum residue into more light products, leaving a smaller proportion of heavy residue. This residue can itself be upgraded, ultimately producing solid coke. As a result, complex refineries, although more energy intensive, are capable of producing a larger proportion of gasoline and gas oil, making use of a larger part of the bottom of the barrel, which would otherwise end up as heavy fuel oil, for which there is today limited market demand. Modern refineries generate the light and clean products that advance society's demand, making our life more comfortable and bringing endless benefits. that video because it's made from the people who make these videos uh, sorry that make oil they profit off of oil so I wanted you to kind of hear that side and then hear this side oh wait I gotta unplug your oil is superheated it becomes refining begins with a process called distilling. After oil is superheated, it becomes vapor. The vapor is fed into the distillation unit. As it rises and cools, the vapor turns back into a liquid. Using stacks of trays, the liquid is easily collected and separated by weight. The lighter and medium weight liquids require less processing before they're ready to be used in cars and trucks. The heavier liquids need more processing to become useful. A process called cracking is used to maximize the usefulness of heavy oil. Heavy oil has long strings of carbon and hydrogen molecules. Using a catalyst, these molecules can be broken into smaller chains transforming the heavy oil into lighter, more valuable fluids. Reforming is a process that increases the amount of gasoline produced from crude oil. One of the products separated in the distilling process is a liquid called naphtha. The number of carbon atoms in naphtha is about the same as the number found in gasoline, but their structure is more complex. Reforming rearranges the naphtha molecule, turning it into a usable, gasoline-like molecule. Blending is a process of mixing different refinery products to make finished petroleum fuels. Gasoline, for example, is blended to achieve octane standards, creating the grades of gasoline you see at the pump, regular, mid-grade, and premium, that are necessary to meet the needs of specific engine types. Treating is a process used to produce cleaner gasoline, which helps protect both the environment and our health. Gasoline molecules contain impurities like sulfur that can be removed. When the molecules are heated and come in contact with a special catalyst, a chemical reaction occurs that strips the sulfur away. These sulfur compounds are used as fertilizers and in pharmaceuticals. 
Nothing goes to waste in a refinery. Okay, so um, I felt like that answered some questions for us about like different types of gasoline, why they have, why are you paying more? Um, cracking is something that I don't remember being in your book anywhere else but here, uh, but that is where you're breaking those carbon chains and making them smaller uh, than the blending, all of those things. I mean, who knew so much? This is what I want to talk to you about. Petrochemicals. About 2% of the products of refining are called petrochemicals, and they are used as raw materials for all of this stuff. So I don't know any of us that have eliminated all of these things. Uh, especially when they li leave it at and many other products. It sounds like petrochemicals are everywhere. Today, much of the world around us is made from petrochemicals. That is just about everything not made from plants, rocks, or metal. Petrochemical products include thousands of essential and life-saving products people use every day. And yes, football fans, that includes the bleachers you sit on, the artificial surface on the field, the lacing in the football, and the uniforms worn by the players. But what are petrochemicals? Well. It all begins very small with the carbon atom, which is the magic behind organic chemistry. Carbon can take different forms, from coal to diamonds to nanotubes. Carbon is truly magical in that it can connect to many different types of atoms, including itself. When it connects, it becomes a molecule, which is nothing more than a group of connected atoms. When carbon connects to itself, and you add a few hydrogens, you get what is called a hydrocarbon molecule. Here is what some of the hydrocarbon molecules look like. They each have similar properties, but are still very different from each other. Hydrocarbons are found in oil and natural gas, which are naturally occurring mixtures formed from decayed plants and animals. Natural gas can exist as both a gas and a liquid under the ground. The gas is comprised mostly of methane, and the liquid is a mixture of ethane, propane, and butane. Some of the natural gas and liquids have been trapped in shale formations. Shale is a type of dense rock. But how do we get it out? We drill. This is the traditional way to drill for natural gas and natural gas liquids. But what about the shale formations far below? Exploration crews can now use a combination of high-tech approaches to get the gas and liquids from the shale rock. This is done through a combination of horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, and seismic imaging. After they drill down, the exploration crews can drill horizontally. Equipped with sophisticated drilling equipment, the crews shoot down a mixture of water, sand, and detergents to crack the rock so that the gas and liquids can escape. The fracturing process takes place thousands of feet below water reservoirs or aquifers. Wherever the drill and pipe pass through a freshwater layer, the water is protected by several impermeable barriers that are made of steel and concrete casings. These barriers ensure maximum protection for water supplies. Once the natural gas liquids are out of the ground, they are separated into the gases ethane, propane, and butane. Of the three, ethane is a very important hydrocarbon molecule. Ethane is fed into a large, complex piece of manufacturing equipment called a cracker. It's called that because it uses high temperatures to crack the bond between carbons. Now, the chemistry takes over. Chemistry is all about bonding. The cracker then forces the carbons to form two bonds with each other that make a new hydrocarbon molecule called ethylene. As one of the most fundamental building blocks in the world of plastics and chemistry, ethylene is special. What makes ethylene special is the double bond between the carbons. This is what an ethane cracker looks like. Ethane comes into the unit by pipeline. 
Now we apply heat to break the carbon bond. Here, you see where the ethylene exits the cracker through another pipeline. From here, ethylene can take two different routes. It can be made into plastic or other chemicals called petrochemical derivatives. They are used as raw materials to make specialty chemicals, which give us products with many performance attributes that consumers enjoy. For example, they make nylon stronger, so it can be used by our armed forces for parachute straps. Or it can be used in a variety of plastic that have characteristics that make them stronger, more flexible and resilient. You saw what a football game would look like without petrochemicals. Now let's see what your life is like with petrochemicals. It's safe to say that from the moment you wake up each morning to the time you go to bed each night, you rely on products made from ethylene and other petrochemicals. Petrochemicals may have been used to make the bedspread on your bed, the carpeting on the floor, the paint on the walls, and the curtains on the windows. They're in many of the materials that go into making your home comfortable and efficient, including foam insulation in walls and attic, vinyl siding, eaves and windows, solar shingles, and a number of deck materials. Even when you go for a drive, know that petrochemicals are making your ride more comfortable. Interestingly, today's windmills wouldn't exist without petroleum-based petrochemicals. The petrochemicals applications go beyond our comfort and entertainment. They are critical to our lives. Modern medicine would be nearly impossible without the many products made from petrochemicals. These include critical devices for surgical procedures, bags that keep blood fresher longer, sterile tubing to deliver life-saving blood in medicine, Everything from the stethoscope to the blood pressure monitor to aspirin is made from petrochemicals. Petrochemicals are also the building blocks for prosthetic and other devices that replace parts of the human body damaged or destroyed by disease, age, or injury. Among petrochemicals, many attributes is the fact that they are also very versatile. Chemists can actually manipulate groups of atoms and make the resulting products perform in special and unique ways, allowing them to be used to make everything from toys to eyewear to bulletproof vests. They make modern communications possible. In fact, regardless of how you're viewing this video, on a desktop computer, laptop, tablet, or smartphone, the viewing device is made from petrochemicals. The future of specialized materials is only limited by our imagination. Breakthroughs are happening every day in electronics, transportation, military applications, and emergency services. None of this would be possible without the world of organic chemistry and petrochemicals. So that certainly narrowed some things down for us, didn't it? Petrochemicals are a big deal. How did I not know about petrochemicals? It's a, uh, I guess, you know, special. So, petrochemicals, um, and for, uh, for everything they just told you about, I don't want you to focus so much on it's called petrochemicals, but I do want you to be able to talk about the importance that this is playing in our lives. Like, I think it's important that you understand that we just can't, you know, like, um, let's talk about something super not controversial, like the uh, Green New Deal. You know, you just can't, when, when they were talking about, you know, reduce the use of fossil fuels, well, you know, to the common person, that may mean they may have been like me and not understood medicine is a part of petrochemicals. You know, like, uh, and, and what's more important, you know, medicine or ice cream. I, I'm going to say it depends on the kind of day I'm having, but, you know, like, we use it a lot. So it would for real mean to, to redo everything that we've done so far. Um, are we running out of conventional oil? So we are using a lot of it. In 2011, we used 32 billion barrels, and that would reach the moon and back 37 times. Um, what do we know has happened between 2011 and 2020 as far as human population goes? Yes, it has definitely increased. Uh, how much is in a barrel of oil? That was kind of one of the questions I had. Um, it's 42 gallons is in one barrel. So all the mathematicians in the room can figure out how much oil we got going. 
the top top three producers, which this is now incorrect, is Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. And um, I'm not going to ask you any questions about this because this is now incorrect. Um, But this is what Saudi Arabia looks like. I may be the only one in this group that was surprised by that. I definitely had a different look. Um, Luke wants to know... (laughs) Um, Who's gone? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Isn't fracking super bad for the Earth's health? We're going to talk about fracking. Um, The short answer is... Stay tuned. So, um, I'm watching Homeland. I don't know if you guys have watched Homeland, but it's pretty good. I've watched season one and two. And so, that's... a A lot of those people are from Saudi Arabia and such, and I didn't see a lot of this in the landscape there, and, you know, but I did see it on TV, so it may not be accurate, but it's not what I expected. So this is um, the top 10 oil-producing countries more to date. Like, I think this is 2018. So as you can see, the United States is now number one oil-producing in, in the world, followed by Saudi Arabia and then Russia. And you've got to understand, remember, it is um, a non-renewable resource. So what probably happened is Saudi Arabia pumped its out, right, pumped all of its oil out, and now it's fallen, and now the United States have overtaken it. Because remember, we're talking about percentages here. So they're not telling you how many barrels so those are all kinds of things to keep into mind. So in 2011, the world's three largest oil consumers were the United States, China, and Japan. Now, two of those three, not a surprise, right? Um, two of those three are two of the three largest countries on the planet. How did China? I mean, how did Japan get there? I don't know. Um, other than they're just, I mean, that's for real how much technology they're using, I guess. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how Japan got there. So, how much oil is there? Like, some of you guys are just like, just get to the point. Like, are we going to run out? The answer is yes, of course we're going to run out. How much is there? I don't know. They don't know. Nobody knows. I mean, this is part of that fear-mongering that, you know, I try to warn you guys about. There's a lot of oil out there. We don't know how much there is. Have we found it all? No. Can we get to it all right now? No. Is technology going to increase? Probably. Um, is it going to get better? I'd say so. Um, are we going to be able to get to oil we haven't been able to get to before? Yep. Are there going to be environmental costs to getting to that oil? Uh-huh. Yep, sure are. So, pros and cons. Geologists have provided us with the estimates of what we think are are remaining so these are the tons per capita and you'll see that uh north america which looks like it looks like it's including um the united states and canada look at me go and then i don't know what's above canada (laughs) but i got some um we got a lot of oil right there guys so that's that's good not all such deposits can be exploited. Oil that cannot be uh, extracted profitably is not considered is not considered to be available. So what we're saying is, if it costs too much money to to extract extrapolate it at this time, we don't count it. Um, but like I said, that's probably going to change in the future. So availability is determined by the demand, the technology, the rate, the cost. And the market price. Um, and we had a great, oh, Greenland, good. That's, I mean, I feel like Greenland's small. Um, yes, and we're going to talk about tamp- tapping into Antarctica and the cost of tapping, because Antarctica, is, that's some scary stuff up there. Um, so if it is a proven oil reserve, this is going to be another test question for you. So if it's a proven oil reserve, that means we can extract it profitably at current prices with current technology. So notice we just created two categories. We've got categories where we've got oil that we 
we, we know it's there. We just can't get to it right now. And then we've got proven oil reserves. We can get there. So it's not fixed. It's proven, but it's not fixed because recently, uh, recently improved oil extraction technology has allowed us to get more out of what we've got, convert heavy oil into light oil, those kinds of things. Um, so both reasons have made profitable, made it profitable to extract light oil that is um, tightly held in layers of shell rock, which has increased the amount of reserves that we have. Um, <laughs> Hi, Rosie. I don't know if I can hear her running in, but they're pulling her out of the house to try to keep her from uh, upsetting us, and she just wants to be with me. Hey, um, Chad, did you guys go feed Brit and Bait and and Mama Fish? Well, that's, that's another trip you could take if you were looking for a trip. Um... So, uh, let's see, Cohen says, no, we can't, no one is legally allowed to be on Antarctica without scientific purposes, that is correct, uh, no, Iceland is, okay, thanks, Harry, um, my bad, Cohen, it's me, <laughs> you all are funny, so, um, the world is not about to run out of conventional light oil in the near future, and we keep finding new ways to do it. So that should make you feel a little better. We can produce more conventional light oil from far offshore, deep ocean, seabed deposits. I may be the only one here that likes to look out at these uh, when I go to the ocean. And I, it makes me feel so bad that I look out and I think, oh, that's pretty. It's got some lights. And like, I know that it's also can be seen as a sad sight, right? That we're extrapolating that oil. So here we go. We can also drill from areas near the Arctic Circle, as is demonstrated here, but we have to be very careful with where we are in the Arctic Circle. And this is called heavy oil. It's bleh, right? It doesn't flow well. It's created from depleted oil wells. It has a low net energy yield. It has a high production cost. It has high environmental impacts. So it, if you ha ever get the chance to see a cancer cell under a microscope, it's super cool. Like you look at that cancer cell and you just think, oh, I get so scared scary and it looks like a monster coming at you like if you look at other cells they're like they're pretty and they're puffy and they they look happy and then you look at this cancer cell and it's like <laughs> right like this is the kind of reaction i have to this heavy oil is it just looks bad um but we are finding ways to convert heavy oil to a more usable uh source more usable method so Having to rely more on such sources is going to leave us with major problems. We have to learn to live with higher oil prices. Therefore, we're going to pay more for all of our oil products, which we just established was everything. Uh, we have to extend supplies by using oil much more efficiently, and we have to use other energy resources. Now, if we go to number two, remember, fuel-efficient cars sound lovely, but the more fuel efficient the car becomes, the bigger the price tag that goes with it. So that's a problem. Okay, 12 countries make up the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And they are all places I have never been. And I, you know, I, I don't need, I, I, I don't know that I can find any of these on a map. Oh, look, they're on the map. <laughs> it's like... It's like I'm, it's Groundhog Day, guys. I was like, I don't even know where these are. So I found a picture with them on the map, and there it is. <laughs> now I don't know that I can pick out which one was which, but look for the blue spots. That's, that's OPEC. Um, <laughs> I should just move on. OPEC has about 72% of the world's proven crude oil reserves, and they, um, OPEC is, is looking, you know, they want to control things. So I found that picture to show you the different flags, um, and hopefully your human geography is going to come into play there. <laughs> almost there, guys. We're almost there.
We've all heard that fossil fuels won't last forever, but why? And if they are set to run out, how much is left? And when will that happen? To dig to the bottom of this one, we first need a quick refresher on how fossil fuels are created. And sadly, no, they're not mostly dead dinosaurs. You see, the vast majority of our fossil fuels come from the remains of plants and animals that lived around 300 to 400 million years ago. And we don't see the first dinosaurs until around about 230 million years ago. So, when these plants and animals died, that very, very long time ago, they were covered in layers of earth or silt. And because of the combined actions of three things, one, the compression from the weight of all that stuff, two, the microorganisms in there decomposing the content, and three, the heat underground, that transformed them into potential fuels. Coal is the remnant of ancient plants, whilst oil and natural gas mostly come from marine creatures, with natural gas being made in deeper, hotter regions where they all get a little bit more cooked. Now we dig or drill this stuff out of the ground, and because it has been accumulating for a long time, initially there was a lot. But because it takes so long to make, we're using it much, much faster than it can possibly be replaced. This means that there is effectively a fixed amount of fuel on Earth, and we're using it up. So, yes, fossil fuels are going to run out, but what is left, and when will that happen? Well, we can fairly easily tally up what's known as our proven resources, the supplies that we know the locations of and we think we have a good chance of getting to. In their statistical review of world energy, BP estimated that the world had just over 1,700 billion proven barrels of oil in 2014. That's enough to meet 52 and a half years of global production. They also estimated just over 187 trillion cubic meters of natural gas. That's enough for 54 years, then 891,531 million tonnes of coal, enough for a whopping 110 years of global production. But there's also the stuff that we know about, can't reach, but think we might be able to get to someday. Hard figures on that are, understandably, tougher to come by. But oil and gas consulting firm Rystad Energy estimates total probable global oil reserves at 2,092 billion barrels, which is enough for about 70 years if our use doesn't go up. The total fuel resource, the amount of fossil fuels that could be out there that we know nothing about, could of course be even higher. But around four years ago, an idea came out that there actually is plenty of oil left, just that we haven't got around to getting it out of the ground yet. This means the numbers for the potential oil out there could in fact be way higher. We've already seen humanity use new technologies to access and use fuels that we couldn't get to before. Things like new techniques to extract oil where it's all mixed up in fine-grained sedimentary rocks like shale, or using high-pressure fracking to extract more oil and gas from the ground. One thing stopping us using these new technologies to extract fuels is that the rising energy costs of extracting it could be just as damaging as the oil running out. Despite the cost of oil, the amount being extracted has actually remained constant, about 75 million barrels per day since 2005. And this means a plateau has been reached where supply cannot match demand. It's also worth pointing out that fracking is far from ideal. It's been claimed that it has been linked to earthquakes and toxic tap water. We've already seen how the economics of getting to the fuel can outweigh humanity's demand for it. In 2016, around 460,000 barrels a day of high cost production like fracking was shut down in the US due to the cost. But that just means, surely it's there for later, when the economics are right, right? Well, maybe we need to leave it there. The planet is warming due to the burning of those fossil fuels. Burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, traps heat, and it causes a greenhouse effect. It's been estimated that we cannot burn more than about a third of those proven resources if we have any hope at all of meeting plans to keep the temperature rise at 2 degrees centigrade or less. Although it may feel that we don't seem to be in a particular hurry to look for alternatives, energy transitions have always taken a long time. It took over 50 years for coal to replace wood as the world's leading source of energy, and another 50 years for oil to overtake coal. So, here's a promising thought. In the end, with so many options for renewable sources of sustainable power being developed, 
we might actually never have to answer this question of what happens when the oil is finally all gone. Right, this is one where we really want to hear your opinions about this whole subject. Put your thoughts down in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Okay, good. Yes, I like him. Um, and again, it's that hopeful, let's not all, you know, concentrate on where I'm going to die today kind of conversations that we tend to avoid here in this subject. So the use of conventional oil has environmental costs, and you really need to be able to talk about them. So land disruption, that's where we're drilling, digging, anything. Greenhouse gas emissions, um, predominantly your greenhouse gas emission is going to be carbon dioxide. Anytime that we're burning these hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide is going to be the primary culprit. Um, air pollution, remember do not just say, excuse me, do not just say air pollution. You want to give me the exact the carbon dioxide, the sulfur dioxide, methane, whatever you're talking about. You want to name that um, pollutant. Same goes for water. And then a loss of biodiversity. You don't just want to say, and then we lose biodiversity. You want to say why we have lost biodiversity. Um, you know, why the animals, the plants, the whatever bio you're talking about has moved away. Why? Um, so that's important. Okay, this is, I don't, I don't know, I feel like it's something that you need to know. Um, I don't think it's in your book, but I wanted to be sure to include it. Um, this happened in your lifetime. So this is off of the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Louisiana. This is called the Deep Water Horizon. And it caught fire and it burned and burned and burned. So for more than 80 days, millions of gallons of oil spewed into the Gulf raising concerns about long-term environmental damage. Uh, this uh, clearly is probably one of the well, most well photographed examples that we have of when things do go wrong, which they very rarely do, because it would be very well documented if it did, um, they go terribly wrong. So this is that cost analysis, right? Um, this, I cannot, I cannot, I can, you can only imagine how Skim did with all of these pictures of all of these dead animals everywhere. Um, it's just a risk that we take during this process. Okay, we're going to touch on oil shell rock, and then we're going to talk about tar sands, and then we're done. So you're almost there. These are oil shells, and this is very predominant. In America. I think America and Russia. The United States of America has an enormous need for a long-term dependable source of energy. One solution is right here in our own backyard, the mining and development of oil shale. 73% of the world's recoverable oil shale is located in the United States, in comparison to only 5% of the world's recoverable oil. Over 1.5 trillion barrels of that oil is estimated to be in the Green River Formation, located in Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming. You're talking about uh, tremendous reserves. If, if we can recover up to 1 trillion barrels of oil, that's more proven reserves than all of the proven reserves in the Middle East put together. So what exactly is oil shale? The first thing to know about oil shale is that you can't see any oil in the material itself. Oil shale is a fine-grained sedimentary rock that contains an organic material called kerogen. Kerogen can be heated, separated from the rock, processed, and turned into liquid shale oil. The liquid shale oil is treated and refined into commercial fuels. The White River Mine sits on 160 acres in one of the richest areas of the Green River Formation in northeastern Utah. In 2005, the BLM solicited nominations for oil shale research, demonstration, and development projects. Six companies applied for the lease of the White River Mine, and after a thorough review, the BLM selected Oil Shale Exploration Company, or OSEC. The lease will give OSEC access to the estimated 14 million barrels of recoverable shale oil on the property. 
It also gives OSEC an option to lease nearly 5,000 acres of nearby land from the BLM. This additional land contains more than 426 million barrels of recoverable shale oil. Plus, OSEC holds another 41,000 acres of private land adjacent to the White River Mine that contains an estimated 2.3 billion barrels more. OSEC has a three-phase plan to mine oil shale from the Green River Formation. The first two phases consist of OSEC's research, development, and demonstration program. Phase one began with the signing of the BLM lease on the 160-acre RD&D site of the White River Mine. First, OSEC moved about 300 tons of oil shale from the mine's existing surface stockpile. Local contractors were hired to load, haul, crush, and ship the oil shale to Calgary, Canada. In Calgary, the shale was processed in the ATP-60 pilot plant, producing OSEC's first batch of shale oil. In Phase 2, OSEC plans to build a much larger commercial-scale plant. The new larger-scale retort will be able to process 250 tons per hour, or 4,000 barrels per day. Phase 3 is the development and operation of multiple processing plants and a fully functioning oil shale mine. OSEC's long-term plan is to produce 50,000 barrels of oil per day. Oil shale can be mined using conventional underground mining techniques. The mined shale is crushed and processed using the Alberta Tassiuk process, or ATP. OSEC is licensed to use the ATP process, and as it moves forward, will work diligently to refine the process and continue to explore more efficient ways to extract oil from oil shale. OSEC's commitment to the environment will ensure full compliance to all applicable laws and regulations. OSEC is fully committed to addressing and studying all environmental issues of the facility. Again, their direction to us was to do a very comprehensive environmental assessment, which we did. They are committed to taking every measure needed to make sure the facility has no significant environmental impact going forward. The consensus is we've got to move ahead and we've got to develop these uh, tar sands and oil shale. With solid government backing, advancements in the ATP process, and the current economic climate, OSEC believes it is perfect timing for developing oil shale in America. We have the greatest supply of oil shale, as my knowledge, there is in the world. So in a way, we become the Saudi Arabia of oil. It could literally shake the world. The time has come. With its significant resources, mining experience, vision, and determination, OSEC is doing its part to develop this much-needed energy source. By developing America's vast supply of oil shale reserves, Oil Shale Exploration Company plans to be part of the energy solution. Okay, so th I realize that for me personally, some of those videos are hard to stay focused on. Um, but the one of the big things, hopefully, that jumped out at you was, we've got this. We've got this in spades. Um, when the guy said we could become the Saudi Arabia of shale, of oil shale, that that shows promise, right? The idea to not have to throw everything out with the bathwater the baby out with the bathwater, as people will say, um, is promising. So, uh, and then I found this guy and I was like, yeah, this is, yes. So the problem is it takes considerable energy, money, and water to extract kerogen from shale rock and convert it to shale, shale oil. So um, you can see like the, they were showing you the rock. You can see um, the, the shell that's in the rock and you're trying to get that kerogen out. And so right now it takes considerable energy, money, and water. But again, that's with technology. Um, the process pollutes large amounts of water and releases to 27 to 52% more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere per unit. So remember carbon dioxide, you always want to consider carbon dioxide a greenhouse gas more so than an air pollutant. Um, but that's that's the, the problem with the greenhouse gases, right? They, they trap heat and they don't allow it to dissipate. So um, right now, the process, the process, 
pollutes more. So again, we would need some technology to come alongside us. Now, tar sands, I just had to find a video because, well, I just had to find a video. <laughs> oh, uh oh, is this going to, okay, good. I thought it was going to be one of those bra ones. No, no, that's keratin. You might not have heard about Canada's oil sands before, but this massive energy project is causing a lot of concern in environmental circles. One organisation has even labelled it the most destructive project on earth. So what exactly is it? Oil sand, or tar sand, depending on who you speak to, is a naturally occurring mixture of sand, clay or other minerals, water and, most importantly, bitumen. This is what a grain of the mixture looks like. Bitumen, which is found on the outside of the grain, is an extremely thick and sticky oil, which must be treated before it can be used by refineries to produce usable fuels like gasoline, or petrol if you live in the UK, and diesel. This sand mixture can be found in several locations around the globe, including Venezuela, the United States and Russia, but it's Canada's deposits of the stuff that have really got people talking. Even the name of Canada's deposits is controversial. While environmentalists prefer to refer to them as tar sands, the Canadian government has officially named the deposits oil sands and says the sand mixture doesn't actually contain any tar. It's popularly believed that tar sounds much dirtier and more threatening than oil and who uses which term has become a massive source of debate. To keep things easy, we'll refer to the deposits by their official name. But let's get back on track. Located below 140,200 square kilometres of land in the country's Alberta province, Canada's oil sands is the third largest proven crude oil reserve in the world, behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. In 2011, it was believed the reserve amounted to 170.2 billion barrels of oil, or about 11% of total global oil reserves. In other words, a lot of oil. In 2012, production at the oil sands reserve was averaging 1.9 million barrels of oil a day, with the Alberta government saying it expects this to increase to 3 million barrels per day by 2018 in order to keep pace with demand. And this expansion is being financed by $19 billion a year in investments. <laughs> Only 20% of the oil sands deposits lie near to the surface where they can be easily mined. And this is around the Athabasca River. The rest of the deposits are buried more than 75 metres below ground. These images from NASA's Landsat satellite show the growth of the surface mines around the Athabasca River between 1984 and 2011. Much of the demand for Canadian oil is coming from the US, the world's largest consumer of oil. Canada is the biggest supplier of oil to the US, and in August 2013, they were sending their neighbour an average 2.6 million barrels of the stuff every single day. The Alberta-based company TransCanada Corp even wants to build a pipeline linking the oil sands to refineries on the US's Gulf Coast. The Keystone XL pipeline would transport 800,000 barrels of oil per day across a distance of 1,179 miles. And the development of Canada's oil sands is concerning environmentalists for several reasons. For starters, producing oil from oil sand or tar sand releases three times the volume of greenhouse gases as producing conventional oil. Every day, 600 million cubic feet of natural gas, a greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuel, is used to produce oil from the oil sands. According to the Pembina Institute, a non-profit environmental organisation, 
That's enough gas to heat more than 3 million Canadian homes. And if all the oil in the oil sands reserve was extracted, then the former NASA climate scientist, Professor James Hansen, believes it would be game over for the climate. But that's not all. The extraction of oil from the oil sands has also led to huge swathes of forest being destroyed. And then there's the contaminated water that's a byproduct of the process used to turn the bitumen into usable fuel. This water contains leftover bitumen as well as solvents used to separate bitumen from the sand mixture and is known as tailings. Energy companies store tailings in open man-made lakes known as tailing ponds. At present, there are more than 170 square kilometres of tailing ponds in the Alberta province, which are considered to be one of the largest human-made structures in the world. In fact, the ponds are so large that they can be seen from space. According to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, these ponds present a number of what they call challenges. This includes the fact that seepage from the groundwater can occur, as well as the fact that the water contains chemicals that are toxic to fish and that residual oil can float to the surface of the ponds and pose a risk to waterfowl. In 2010, the energy company Syncrude was fined 3 million Canadian dollars after a flock of 1,606 birds died after landing on its tailings ponds back in 2008. And according to a 2008 report by the non-profit social movement organisation, the Polaris Institute, there had been an unusually high rate of illnesses amongst the tiny community of Fort Chippewyan, located on the Athabasca Lake into which the Athabasca River flows. This included unusual rates of a bile duct cancer that is very rare. And the community believes the source of their sickness is the water. And in October 2013, communities bordering the Athabasca River were warned not to drink from the waterway after a breach in a tailing storage pond dumped 1 billion litres of contaminated water. If development of the oil sands reserve continues to expand at current rates, then according to the Pembina Institute, by 2022, so much fuel will be being produced that just a month's output of this contaminated wastewater could turn an area the size of New York Central Park into a toxic reservoir 11 feet deep. But despite the ongoing expansion of development at oil sands, there are signs that the tide is beginning to turn against the project. A European Union intention to designate oil from sands as 25% more polluting than conventional oil would effectively see imports of oil from the oil sands banned. Naturally, the Canadian government isn't all that happy about this, however, and has even threatened a trade war with the EU over the proposal. Only time will tell who will win out. So in the meantime, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this, so leave a comment and we'll see you again next time. So what do you do when your computer crashes and all those memories you've been storing for years? You can set her down. Okay. Um. <laughs> there you go. Now, Rosie's joined us there to a cool girl. Yes, she is. Okay. Um, so, Kaylee asked, um, is oil sand on top or is it buried? It's buried, and that's where a lot of those... Um, the, I, I'm assuming this water that you're seeing right there is a part of those contaminated water reserves that it, it becomes a problem. So oil sands, as of right now, again, this is based on the technology that we know now is no bueno. Uh, and that's it. Oh my gosh, that's it. You did it. Like Rosie made it all the way to the end and then she jumped up. So, um, I, I don't know, guys. Our takeaway on this, it's a lot. Uh, I, I know it's a lot. Oil is a lot. Um, oil is the biggest that, that we're going to talk about as far as just content, content, content. Um, but we use oil with so much. So, uh, things that you want to be able, things that you need to be able to talk about, at least at some level, are um, shell oil, tar sands. I mean, there'll be a couple of questions on both of those. Crude oil, petroleum, the refining process, right? How do we pull those off? Um, and then the environmental impacts of harvesting this oil. 
So remember, there are, uh, yes, so there are many, many alternatives to non-renewable, but oil is, oil is our big one. So I've texted my mentor. She hasn't, oh, wait, as I speak. Um, let's see. So my mentor says she also sees um, them asking you guys about biogeochemical cycles because it touches on so many topics. So um, I don't know, guys. I, I feel like we're doing what we need to be doing, trying to pull back in uh, all of the all of those things, right? All of this is carbon cycle, the recycling of the carbon. Uh, and and law of conservation of mass and all the carbon that we have is all the carbon that we're gonna have. So I, I think I think we're on the right path. So tomorrow, um, you know, I may even be willing to give you guys some uh, a little heads up. I might even post the vocab quiz early. So those of you that like to get those things done done, uh, I will post fifteen one and fifteen two, and it will be due tomorrow, and then um, on Wednesday, which is the 8th, I will assign the vocab quiz 15.3 through 15.6. I don't even think there's any words in 15.6 at all. Um, and then we'll take that vocab quiz on, I'll assign that on the 9th. So we'll lecture Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we'll take our next unit test on Friday. So we'll, we'll get through, today is coal, I mean, today is oil, Tomorrow will be gas, and then um, after gas, coal. See, it goes a lot quicker after this. And then nuclear. So we'll do coal, and then gas, and then nuclear. Coal, gas, nuclear. And that should be it. Yep, that's it. So... Um, each one, and see, here's my, did you see her? Here's my homeland. There's my homeland girl right there. Terrorist attack. We got some stuff to talk about, y'all. Um, I miss you terribly. Rosie does not miss you terribly. She's so happy to have me home. You want to say hi? You want to say hi to the baby? That's a baby. Uh, but we love you guys. We know you're hanging in there. Uh, text call, email, do what you got to do, get a hold of me, uh, and until I can stand before you in our classroom, I will see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock.